So I'm gonna be honest here. Normally on this channel, we have like a pretty elaborate multi-person vetting process for choosing topics. But last night I saw a picture of the inside of a professional bowling ball. And frankly, it was so haunting that it sent me into a several hour long dissociative feud where I read every single Wikipedia page about bowling. And now I have a lot of stuff to say about bowling. And the person I'm gonna say it to is you. You think you know what bowling is? You do not know what bowling is. The game you play at bowling alleys is the bowling equivalent to playing chess with only pawns and also there's no chessboard and actually you're just eating the pawns out of a cereal bowl. There are so many bizarrely complicated invisible dimensions to professional bowling that frankly, I had no idea existed until last night. So let's talk about how bowling actually works and of course, why the inside of bowling balls look like that. First, the basics. In 10 pin bowling, you've got 10 pins. You wanna knock them down. You can roll a bowling ball at them and hope that does the job. That's the main strategy at least. The most consistent way to knock down all 10 pins is to go for something called a perfect strike, where the ball itself only needs to come into contact with four of the pins to knock down all 10. And generally speaking, there are three techniques for bowling a perfect strike. Conventional pro bowlers, who are usually called strokers, but will absolutely not be called strokers in this video for fear of it getting demonetized, want their ball to do this. Travel in a relatively straight line down the lane, hit the pins right here between the one and three pin, and continue on to hit pins five and nine. One will take care of two, four, and seven, three will take care of six and 10, and five will take out pin number eight. If you do the math, which I'm frankly too lazy to do, that should add up to somewhere around 10. Next, you've got crankers. And no one is going to make fun of me when I say the following sentence, which is that crankers are a lot like strokers, but they stroke harder and at a different angle. It's not my fault that those are the technical terms here, and I will not apologize or change the age settings on this video. Crankers are looking to hit the same pins in the same order, but at a much steeper angle. Getting the ball to hit the one to three pocket from here gives it a much wider point of entry, but it also means that you have to get the ball's path to curve, or hook, much more aggressively as it goes down the lane. This technique requires a little less accuracy, but a lot more finesse. Finally, you have spinners. This is a pretty rare technique that really only works in Asian bowling alleys for some incredibly weird and technical reasons that rest assured, I will give a mediocre explanation of in about three minutes. Spinners need the ball to essentially skid all the way down the lane, not rolling at all, but instead spinning counterclockwise when it hits the pins. The balls have to travel along this diagonal line, hitting one, three, six, and 10, with its spinning motion sending each of those pins in a precise arc directly opposite the ball, essentially setting up three sets of dominoes with the rest of the pins. Is this easy? No. Can a normal bowling ball do this? Not really. But can you design a bowling ball to do this? Well, yes. All of these techniques require some really specific engineering, both on the inside and outside of a pro level bowling ball. And it all starts in the ball's core. The core of a normal bowling ball, the kind that you'd get at a recreational bowling alley, looks like this, which is to say it looks like nothing. House balls are generally just fitted with some kind of foam, and the only thing they're good at is proving a fleeting distraction at an otherwise mediocre birthday party. A professional ball, on the other hand, will have one of three different kinds of weighted cores. The first two, pancake and symmetrical cores, ensure that the ball is perfectly balanced from right to left, which means that it'll roll in a straighter line and hook less aggressively. The difference between the two is about where that weight is distributed. Symmetrical cores keep it closer to the center of the ball, meaning that the ball will start rolling and hooking sooner, whereas pancake cores concentrate the weight near the outside of the ball, making it skid for much longer and only start rolling near the very end. This makes pancake cores best for the straightest possible shot, ideal for picking off a few remaining pins to get spare, or for taking out one of the unblinking knees who won't stop watching you bowl. Asymmetric cores, which can take dozens of different forms and look like some kind of biblically accurate angel, make the ball intentionally unbalanced in some way, which can get it to hook much more aggressively than your biblically accurate cores. Now, all of this makes bowling seem like an awfully complicated game, but we haven't even scratched the surface, like the literal surface. It turns out that the outside of the bowling balls is its own whole thing. And this is where the video sort of spirals out of control as I talk at excessive length about how bowling lanes are oiled because my God, how was I supposed to know that there was this much to say about bowling lane oil? But of course, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk cover stock for a second. The exterior bowling balls can be made from polyester, polyurethane, or a fairly new material called reactive resin. The main difference between these materials is how much friction they provide, with more friction causing the ball to start rolling earlier, kind of, sometimes. In reality, that's only half the equation because the other half of the equation is invisible. You know how bowling lanes look like they're just an innocent, uniform wooden surface? Well, they're not. Bowling lanes are oiled, and because some sicko decided it would be interesting, they're not supposed to be oiled evenly. 
Even though you can't see it, oil on a bowling lane is distributed in a specific pattern. What pattern, you ask? Wrong question, dummy. There's hundreds of patterns. You've got Badger, Chameleon, Cheetah, Shark, Viper, Earl Anthony. And all of these vicious creatures drastically change the way a ball behaves on the lane. How long it skids, where it starts rolling, and what kind of hooks are even possible on the lane. Some patterns are much harder than others. Recreational bowling alleys usually oil patterns like this that are designed to coax the ball into exactly the right place, but there are also oil patterns like this that make no sense and are designed to ruin your life. Asian bowling alleys often have much longer oil patterns, which is why spinning is a viable strategy in Taipei, but borderline impossible in New Jersey. And to make things even more complicated, because, you know, why not, the oil pattern will change over the course of a single game as balls push the oil down the lane. All of this is to say, the cover stock of your ball depends on your bowling strategy, but it also depends on where and when you're bowling. You might want to have a polyurethane ball for bowling on dry lanes, but you might also need a resin ball for your next tournament at Giuseppe Di Spaghetto Ballarama, where all the lanes are extra sauce for a slippery good time. What was the point of this video again? I'm not really sure. Maybe I just unexpectedly developed a lot of respect for professional bowlers and educational video essays are the only way I know how to express my emotions. And maybe this video doesn't have a coherent purpose, but coherence isn't always the point. After all, to quote the great Pete Weber, who do you think you are? I am. And here's another thing I am. One of the co-founders of Nebula, a creator-owned, creator-led streaming service that is currently, and I think I can say this objectively, absolutely popping off. We spent the last few years giving creators the resources and infrastructure to develop the sort of big projects that just couldn't work on YouTube, and the results have been amazing. We've seen short films from friends of the channel like Patrick Willems, Abby Thorne, and Jesse Gender, groundbreaking documentaries from folks like Bobby Broccoli and Tom Nicholas, and even a live comedy debate show called Abolish Everything, which me and my writers produce every month in New York City. So if you want to check out any of those exciting projects, or if you just want to support an independent creator-built platform trying to elevate independent content creators, sign up for Nebula right now. With the link in the description, you can get 40% off an annual subscription, just $36 for the whole year.